Good evening, friends and guests. Lovely to see you here. My name is Fee MacDonald. I'm one of three Associate Artistic Directors here at Queensland Theatre, and it's very lovely to see you here tonight for the play briefing for Cost of Living. Can I take a moment, please, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're gathered on today, the Yuggera and the Turrbal people, and send our biggest love and respect to their elders past and present and take a moment to honour these beautiful lands where stories have been told for millennia and we're very, very lucky to continue to tell stories. This evening's play briefing is again being recorded, so if and when, we come, it, when it comes time for questions, uh, myself or one of us will repeat the question into the microphone. Uh, and can I ask that please no photography, uh, video, recording of any kind from your kind selves. Uh, can I also take a moment to thank you? Thank you for being here. Many of you here tonight are our uh, supporters, our uh, sponsors, our visionaries, our legends, and our subscribers, and it's always lovely to see you here. So thank you again for coming. Yes. I'll take a moment to introduce the incredible people who are here on stage with me, and then I'll, we'll get cracking, hey? Can I please introduce to my left the incredible Priscilla Jackman, who is directing the work, the incredible Dan Dore, who is directing and performing in the work, uh, performing the role of John, to make sure I got the right one, the remarkable Philip Quast, who is performing the role of Eddie, the incredible Kate Hood, who is performing the role of Arnie, the lovely Zoe de Plevitz, who is performing the role of Jess, Michael Scott Mitchell, who is our set and costume designer, John Raymond, who's our lighting designer, and Guy down the far end, Guy Webster, our composer and sound designer, and the beautiful Sophia, who is our Auslan interpreter. <laughs> so, to give you a quick rundown of what you're in for, Cost of Living was written by, in 2016, by Martina Majok and won the 2018 Pulitzer Award for Drama. Majok is a po Polish-American playwright who moved to New Jersey as a child from Poland. Did I, did I do that okay? Oh, Gabs isn't here. Uh, her writing often explores loneliness and love, is politically engaged and splintered with dark humour. Her work is often centred around strong female characters, characters from immigrant backgrounds and shows us people and lives from our society that are often underrepresented on our stages. And I give you that background because uh, a lot of those layers you will see in Cost of Living. Cost of Living features four characters who I introduce the performers. So Eddie, who Philip is playing, is an older man who's an out of work truck driver and the estranged partner to Arnie. Arnie, who's being played by Kate Hood, is the estranged partner to Eddie, an older woman learning to live with an acquired disability and the annoyance of Eddie. <laughs> John is a wealthy, young PhD student living with cerebral palsy, and Jess is a young woman from a migrant background who comes to work for John. The play is set in New Jersey from September to December. The story in the play is not told chronologically. It begins at the end of Eddie's story on the night before Christmas and then travels back in time and we see the unfurling of the interconnected stories of the four characters. This play weaves stories of ableism, poverty, wealth, the working class together but shows us our humanity, our basic human need for love, connection, care and to care for someone else. The work also comes with some warnings. There's some coarse language the use of herbal cigarettes, there'll be theatrical haze, and there is complete nudity. The work also grapples with adult themes, including sexual references, death, and loss. The work grapples with grief, but it also shows us the joy in the small things. Oh, darling, I promise it's not that bad. <laughs> it's, it's not a complete downer. It's got beautiful dark humour in it. I, fe I feel it. It's Monday night. Anyway. That's enough from me. I now get the very, you know, dear privilege to talk to these incredible artists on our stage. I've got some warm-up questions that I thought we could start with. Have we got any burning questions already, just so I get a bit of a gauge? Not yet. Okay, I'll warm us up and you have a think about what you might want to know as we continue on. So, Priscilla... Oh, one right here. Fabulous. 
Oh, sorry if you missed it at the beginning. I'm Fee MacDonald. I'm one of the Associate Artistic Directors here at Queensland Theatre. I look after the education and youth team. So not much to do with this one in, you know, the real sense of it, because we haven't got many schools coming to this one, but, you know, it's still, um, shall we say, lifelong learning for all of us to come to the theatre. So maybe it all has to do with me. Uh, Priscilla. Um, now, we are incredibly lucky to have this work at Queensland Theatre, but I don't believe it was actually our idea. I believe that this work coming to Queensland Theatre might have been your idea. Can you tell me that story? Yes, it was... Um, it really begins the story back when Dan and I met each other and it was kind of a chance meeting in 2018 at the Sydney Festival. And I saw this amazing show called Beast and it made my mind and body and soul really respond in a vibrational way where I felt really awake and really confronted and really excited by the work. It was a dance piece and I thought the physical duration and the call to uh, ask many questions as a result of seeing this was very exciting as an audience member. And I remember distinctly thinking, gee, these these boys from Berlin, they know all about, you know, creating great edgy theatre. And I went and did a, a bit of a, a Google search afterwards of Dan Dorr and saw, of course, that he's one of my fellow Aussies. And I emailed him uh, or, or Facebooked and said, listen, I'd love to meet for a coffee. I knew that Dan was living in the UK and we met for a coffee and we just had a really um, important connection with one another. And I just thought then and there, I would love to make some work at some stage with Dan Dorr. Now, it took many years, and in some ways, perhaps, I had imagined it would be a piece that we'd devise. Um, but it was a year or so later that I came across the play, The Cost of Living, it was 2019. And an artistic director had said to me that he was really looking for Pulitzer Prize winning work that was beautifully crafted, but also that had some edge to it. So I remember reading this play and from the first couple of pages I knew that it was something extraordinary and the second thing that I knew was that it was a wonder and a mystery to me how it could not have been programmed on our Australian stages yet. Um, I sent the script to Dan Dorr and didn't know whether it was something that Dan would, would you know, like or not and we had kept in touch even though you were living back in Manchester at this time I think. Um, and Dan wrote a couple of lines back to me and said, I effing heart this play. I want to be in. Let's do it. It was about three lines that then gave way to hours and hours and hours of conversation about the work. So we felt pretty equipped um, talking about this work across the country. I knew that Australian artistic directors would be tentative about casting. Um, but I thought with Dan in the role of John, it felt to me like a role that he was made to, you know, it was made for him. Um, by 2020, um, when we were in the throes of COVID, um, Kate Hood and I had connected and Kate and Dan and I spent a long time chatting about the work and we set up a play reading. And when we first read the play online, of course, we were marvelled by how much humour was in the work as well, which perhaps went beyond anything that we had expected initially. But it was still quite a slog, actually, to, uh, to get the, the work programmed. And it was here in Queensland, in your foyer, where very important conversations happen, that on the opening night of White Pearl, I said to, uh, to Lee Lewis, who was artistic director at the time, I have got a show for you and uh, I have got the cast as well. And um, I said to her, it's called Cost of Living, and she took a few beats and she said, I know the work, I know the work, but I don't know how to cast it. I said, don't worry, we've got Dan Dor, and we've got Kate Hood, and Philip Quas came on after that and Zoe after that, and we were really moved because it took actually this play for Dan and I to realise that our home as children is Brisbane, both of us and it had been all the way around the world and back again and all the way around the country um, talking about this work before we had um, the faith of Queensland Theatre to say, yes, there are lots of challenges, it is different from anything we've seen on main stage before and it is a work that Australian audiences need to see and will get something from 
even though it's not set in Australia, that we have the intelligence and the resonance as humans to connect with this work no matter who we are or what our life experience is. And we couldn't be more grateful. Hear, hear. And the work is truly incredible and it, it's, we're very, very lucky to have partnered as well with our uh, co-presenting partners with Sydney Theatre Company. So this is the Australian premiere here in Brisbane. We're very lucky. Thank you all of you. And after the season here, it will go to Sydney. So if you love it and you've got friends or family in Sydney, tell them to go, please. Now, can I extend on that conversation? Um, Dan, I know in your incredible work, you're often collaborative and you're devising works. Um, have you worked in this way before where you've got an, an extant script, but you're directing and performing? And, and what's that experience like, getting to work with Priscilla and this team? Uh, yeah, I uh, make uh, devised work and I... Uh invariably always end up writing the script as well as, as as we're kind of going and I'm used to making work from inside the piece itself. Um, I've not ever made work where I'm uh, wholly and solely a director on the outside. Um, so, and we had very many conversations, didn't we, about how we work and, and how we are in the room and how the, the way we think about work really aligned, um, I would say. And it's, it's been, it, it's the first time I, I've, I've uh, been in a, a, um, like a, a, a play uh, a, a, and made a play um, because of my background in theatre, going into dance and then kind of finding my way back into theatre. But I've really approached this the same way that I make devised work in that it's been highly collaborative and we've invited these incredible voices um, into our conversations as well to really spar off of each other. So it's felt, yeah, it, it, it's, it's made a lot of sense to how I usually work. So, so it's different, but also I, I've been able to apply my past knowledge to this way of working. Beautiful, thank you. Do you have something to add, Priscilla? Um, it just, it struck us the other day when we were being interviewed for ABC Radio National, didn't it? You said so beautifully, Dan, that there's um, two couples in this work, um, one disabled, one non-disabled in each of the couples. And we realised as we stared at each other across the interview thing that there's a third couple. <laughs> and that this idea of us creating a work where we have different lived experiences that we are acknowledging, that we bring to our work um, and yet shared values for what will make this work work feels like a real reflection of actually what Martina Mayok is inviting us to experience through the characters as well. Yeah, 100%. And I understand as well that Martina, in her lived experience, spent a long time as a support worker and a care worker and that was part of the inspiration of her writing this work was that lived experience and seeing so many incredible stories over her time as a, as a playwright. On that note, can I actually jump down to you, Zoe? Can I open to you to tell us a little bit about Jess, about the character that you're playing and, and the joy and any exciting things that this dear audience may want to know? Uh, yeah, so that's ex exactly right. Um, uh, Fee, the Martina, she based a, a lot of um, Jess on her own experiences and there's a lot of uh, her own life and the interviews that I've watched ab um, about her life have been really uh, insightful for me to develop the character. Uh, it's, it's slightly different because Martina was actually born overseas and then came to America, uh, whereas Jess or you'll find out, but she, she's born in the United States. So it's a, it's a bit of a, her character's a bit of a cobble together with her sister and her, her family. Um, it, it explores, I think, 
a lot of what immigrants feel in any country that they go to. So you, you, you get it in Australia, you get it in the United States, you get it in Europe, the people that move around. And it's tough for anyone who comes to another country and they have to start from the bottom again. Um, so even though Jess's mother isn't in the story, she's very present in the story and she was the one who was the immigrant in the story. Um, and that's, I think Martina brought a lot of, of her mum because she had a very strong, or she has a very strong relationship with her mother into Jess as well. Yeah, gorgeous. I think what's really interesting about the dynamic across um, those, this particular couple is the very distinct picture of class uh, and, and something that you can see being built behind us. It's, we bumped out Medea on Saturday night and can I just have a moment, can we give it up for our production crew, please? They're probably quite literally having a nap in the dressing room. They've been working non-stop since we closed Medea at 9pm on Saturday night to get this stage built. And we're previewing on Thursday this week for Cost of Living. So they are cracking on, transferring, uh, transforming this beautiful theatre from, if any of you saw Medea, uh, fishbowl into something new. And I'm going to throw to you now, Michael, just to tell us a little bit about the flavours and, and how you're capturing the essence of New Jersey and that class, you know, how we're swapping from the um, John's apartment to Eddie and, and uh, Arnie's apartment. Well, it's got a white floor. <laughs> really? Tell and us that's more. That's about it. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's actually a beautiful but very tricky piece to resolve on stage. And I think we've all variously had those conversations over the past few weeks. But it is a magnificent piece and, and well worth the trouble. Uh, I think the thing about the design work is that it's not... It's trying to tread a line between a naturalism and non-naturalism. Because I don't think you can, in a space like this, you can very successfully put two abodes side by side. It becomes a tennis match. You're looking at a naturalistic rundown space, another space that is uh, owned by a wealthy young man. You actually have to pick signifiers from those environments and meld them into an overall design um, concept. And we still don't know what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> but we're getting there. Um, I guess the practical limitations are also significant in that because of the nature of this stage and how you view the stage, there's nowhere to hide. So getting people on and off stage is uh, itself a challenge and particularly um, with ha having to deal with wheelchair ramps and a whole series of necessary and important things, the space gets gobbled up very quickly. And so you have to be eloquent in terms of how you choose the symbols, I guess, that we're, we're representing. Um, but beyond that, where every day is exciting because we're discovering something new, and which is as it should be. In fact, I, I, I read an article, well, I, um, an interview with um, David Bowie and he said as an artist if you're not pushing yourself out in the water and taking one more step and feeling frightened then you're not doing your job and that's certainly me at this moment in time. <laughs> and Michael on that note we should mention water. Indeed uh, yes um, it's funny enough it's not I don't think it's directly expressed anywhere that she's doing, using water in the way that she has, or that its symbolism or its, its import is ever literally revealed in the text. But almost every scene has a connection back to water. So you can see on the back wall there's an abstracted version of water come mist. In the centre of the stage, that diamond there has a, a plug-in shower unit where Dan takes his shower. The same area is used um, by Kate and... Uh, and Philip for a bath scene. Literally every scene has oh, it's either snowing or raining or people are getting wet on their way to somewhere. Another feeling. Um, but it's yeah, what I love about it is it's she leaves the discovery of what that element is about and what it's for for each scene to you and and to the performers and the people creating the work. She doesn't say you have to do this for these reasons, and that's. That's a perfect way of sneering good work out of people, you know. Mm. Yeah. 
Love it. And John, are you extending that the play with water and any symbolism with water into lighting? Are we going to see any motifs coming through from lighting or...? Uh, spoiler alert, it's likely. <laughs> um, I didn't even know. It's good for me uh, too. But it's, you know, my, my, my actual expression uh, starts in earnest tomorrow. I, I, I fall into that design discipline where I have to do all my sketching and all my work in front of everybody else while they... You know, sharp intake of breath, or do you, do you really think you should do that? Or, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, but Michael, Michael and I have worked on a number of productions, and he always provides an extraordinary palette. Uh, uh, no, on a number of productions. <laughs> no, no, I said with water. Well, no. Yeah. Well. So the Olympic Oh, okay. I, I wasn't thinking of that as theatre so much That's as right spectacle. But yes, okay. <laughs> we, um, we've done water before. Uh, <laughs> With some success, <laughs> according to the viewing audience, anyway. Uh, and when Michael provides, uh, he, he's one of those great designers who, 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 with his ingenious interpretation of the demands of the play and of the space, uh, but he then allows that the other visual artist uh, will bring a contribution to that and to the realisation of it as a theatrical space. At the moment, you would say this is lit in a fairly sort of basic way. Uh, my job is to take it from this uh, into a world that enables you to find your way visually in, that supports the, the change between uh, the apartments and the, the class, if you will, however that's expressed in light. Uh, and in fact, I was just saying to Zoe before we came on, um, in reference to this work light, uh, that one of the things that I do, uh, or should strive to do, is to provide an environment in which the actors themselves feel supported in what they're doing. Uh, if it's a world that they feel supports and is, is credible for the character that they're playing in that circumstance, uh, that's half the job. Uh, what you see and what they feel uh, is part of the contract. You come in, you know, it's a shared, a shared experience uh, and my, my job is to uh, give you a visual way in. So yes, there will be water themes. There are a number of, it's episodic, uh, and the transitions between scenes, we are still working on them in earnest, uh, but part of that theatrical language is what we have to explore in the coming week, uh, which is very exciting. It's a great time, uh, this moving into the theatre, so um, it's not straightforward, and that's what we love. Indeed. Thank you, John. Can I come back down to our beautiful cast now? Can I throw to you, maybe Kate, can I get you to tell us a little bit about Arnie? Ooh, sure. Arnie. Arnie is a person with an acquired disability, a bit like me. Um, she has lived all of her life without a disability until she had a car accident. And so the car accident has made her a paraplegic, which I'm not, but she is. Um, and also she doesn't have the use of her arms. So she's paraplegic with damaged arms, but possibly could be considered a quadriplegic, uh, but partly damaged arms. Um, and she is, aside from all that, she is a very um, determined, independent, forthright, no-nonsense kind of woman. So, when she and Eddie separated, she just had decided that she was going to get on with it. And in fact, they separated at the time that she had the accident. So she was in hospital, and I think this is right. Um, they, Eddie left her in the hospital and went off with somebody else, which ha he had already done. <laughs> We were separated. <laughs> but it, it really is very complex because they end up, she ends up forgiving him for that and seeing why, actually. And it examines the complexity of acquired disability and what that does to relationships. And so this is not a play about disability, by the way. It's a play about relationships about human relationships. And it very cleverly uses disability 
as a tool to explore the boundaries of human relationships and the boundaries of love particularly. So I love it from that point of view because that's never done in Australia especially. And so, you know, it's time that we saw people with disabilities as, you know, a variation of being human, actually. We are one in five. Thank you. Yeah, we are. Indeed. Hear, hear, Kate. Thank you very much. I love what you said about the complexity of the, the, that relationship as well. And I love, which you'll all get to see, how, how layered all of the relationships are in the work and the, the incredible journey they go on. Philip, Eddie's quite an intriguing character. He goes on quite the journey, particularly where we see him at the beginning of the production and then where we see him get to again. Can you tell us a little bit about Eddie and his journey? Well, the interesting thing about these two is that they're both alcoholics. <laughs> and they think they're with each other because of their codependency. And it's been a very interesting journey for me as an actor. I keep discovering more and more every day in this. But because that uh, disability occurs and that shock, uh, he doesn't know how to adjust to what he thinks is their what their relationship is based on. And I think he goes through this journey by realizing that certain people just need each other, regardless of disability or regardless of their alcoholism. And it's a discovery, you know, he couldn't cope with her disability, but he dis he, the journey he goes through is that the disability is irrelevant. <laughs> that he actually just needs to be with her regardless. And it makes me think of lots of things about couples who are aging together and one gets Alzheimer's. It, it brings, or you know, we've, we've got to deal with that because some things are quick, some things are slow, people get terminal illnesses. And I, I found it as an actor being here, I've learned so much about life and it's made me think about lots of things. Uh, but also we've got to look at, we've, I've had to think about the title of the play, it's called Cost of Living. And America is in crisis because there's whole people that are, are drug addicts and are being forgotten under this, this uh, melee, mishmash of politics now in America that unless you are working, you're stuffed. They've got no one to look after them uh, at all. And uh, it's a bit of a worry, you know. And, and the only way that we know, and for me, Eddie, is that he is a carer, he's a giver. And he discovers that he can give. And the more he can give, the more he receives. So I suppose, for me, the metaphor is the more we look after those people in need, actually, we need them. Because they teach us how we can only function and avoid our own selfishness. Is that clear? Yeah? 100%. Yeah, I think there's definitely sentiments in the work that we all need each other, no matter what, no matter what's in the relationship, no matter what's happened, particularly when we see an incredible established relationship and you really start to see that they've lived a life together and that's actually the joy of that relationship in many ways. A resonance I'm sure many of us can feel when you look back, even through hardship, you kind of go, there is all of that beauty there. Can I throw it down to the very end there? Hi, Guy. Hi, Fee. How are you going? I'm well. How's the, how's the weather down that end? Oh, it's nice. Yeah? We're having how's, a great time. I was about to say, how's New, how's New Jersey in December? I reckon it might be a bit cold. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your composition and sound design for this work and, and how you're supporting to tell this remarkable story? Sure. Uh, there's, a, there's a very consistent sense of life and the experience of living in this script and the sense that it never stands still. Uh, for each of the characters, they talk, they talk about during their scenes uh, their ongoing experiences and challenges and difficulties and how they may have had wins, had losses, 
on their own with each other. It's just an ongoing journey of how we navigate living life. Um, but one of the things that Martina has put into the script is the sense of outside, the sense of life going on around them. Each scene, except for one, so most of the scenes, is set internally, interior, in an interior space. But nearly every scene has a description of what's happening outside. It's raining, there is traffic. So there is this, even in the writing, Martina has considered the sense of life going on around these characters. And that's been a really big part of how I have approached the sense of sound design and even the music in this piece. The sense that there is activity, there is a world going on around them and while they are in these moments, we are kind of experiencing with them a little moment in time in their bubble, in their life bubble. But there's always this sense of the world going on and they have to, at beyond this moment, venture out into it. And that's kind of a big part of what the transitions are, this sense of travel, this sense of, I have to go out into the world and it's gonna be a lot more intense than what I can experience just here in my world. And so during the transitions, there's a lot of movement, of travel, a sense of moving from one place to another, but a sense of moving through a world that is part of a, a large city, a large living city. Um, so that's been a big part of how I've considered the approach to the world of the play. And then there's also been the sense of the individual journeys through the piece and how I can, how I can engage and assist with a sense of journey for audience but also for characters and the performers, wonderful performers. Uh, but this is always an ongoing quest. How do we get to the best version of this story? And we are well and truly on our way but we are going to discover a lot in this coming week and uh, we really look forward to sharing it. Indeed. Thank you. A round of applause for all of these incredible creatives up on this stage. It's come to that time where we are looking to our audience for any burning questions you may have. I've got a few hands up. Fantastic. Oh, just a reminder, I'm going to repeat everyone's question into the microphone for our viewers at home. Over here. The question was, are we going to hear American accents? And if so, could it actually have been translated into Australia? Because it sounds like it can go anywhere. Um, it's a really great question and one we asked ourselves a lot in the very early um, conversations, particularly with Lee Lewis and Kip as well, Kip Williams from STC. Um, Dan and I had ongoing conversations. And at one point I wondered if, yes, it could sit in an Australian landscape instead. Um, and for two reasons, I um, believe that's not the case. Um, one is that the rhythms and the rapid fire um, pace and nuance is so deliciously specific to New Jersey that it felt like it is not honouring the text to bring it into an Australian vernacular. And nor is it necessary, I think. Um, it's always good for us to interrogate whether that would be helpful and beneficial to an audience. But I believe that the resonances of what the themes are and what this play teaches us as an, as an Australian audience is almost more important when we see it reflected in the American landscape because it actually stands as a warning of what happens to a society when we don't have Medicare, when we, do, when we only rely on private health cover. And I think it stands as a real um, testament to where we are as a nation and why it is really important that we systemically and politically take care of each other because otherwise we will be in societies that um, are in the place of America. 
Um, and so those two things about the actual rhythms are not our rhythms, and yet as an Australian audience, because of our television, because of being a Western, you know, co-Western powers, we understand each other enough to understand the accents and appreciate them and appreciate the humour. And I think our audience is intelligent enough to be able to keep that at an, at an arm's length, see ourselves in some way through these characters, but not have to hear those characters transported into an Australian accent. Beautiful. Great answer. Thanks, Priscilla. <laughs> Up here. This question is from an uh, artist who is a disabled artist, asking Dan and Kate uh, if the perspective of Martina, who's a non-disabled writer, has written the characters well and if there's anything they would change or have changed in the work. Dan and Kate, over to you. Me? Uh, do you want to get that? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll have things to say too. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, okay. In Australia, it is commonplace for uh, disabled characters to be portrayed by non-disabled actors. Very commonplace. We see it all the time. Happens all the time. And I've been advocating for years and years about this to say, no, we need to actually do something better than that. We need to let disabled actors into drama schools and so that they're on the same pathway as non-disabled actors. I'm not saying every disabled actor is going to be able to do this, but hey, not every non-disabled actor is able to do this either. So, you know, it's a great equaliser to think about things from that point of view. But back to your question, Martina Marjok is not disabled, but she is portraying disabled people through her experience of working as a disability carer. So I'll let that one go. You know, I'm kind of, I'm like this about it, but I'm, I'm okay. Because she's done something pretty incredible, and that is she's said no non-disabled actor is allowed to play either of these two roles, ever. And that meant that her Pulitzer Prize winning play didn't get a shot. It didn't get done in America, except by, I think, one company um, until, ooh, a couple of years ago. So that's where the world is about disability and the performing arts. And so I think what you and I have got to do is just keep going and keep asking the questions and keep kind of making ourselves known to people. I think that's what we've got to do. So what's your name? Joel. Joel, for everyone at home. His name's Joel. Looking at you, Joel. All right. Dan, thoughts? And, and just to add, add to Kate's answer, I love this play so much because Martina's not scared to paint all the characters as deeply flawed. And, and, that, and that goes for the disabled characters as well. So it's really exciting as a disabled actor to be able to play a role that's deeply flawed and deeply de having to deal with a lot of different things and not necessarily always a nice person and you're not always like John, but I love, I love, I love that Martina gives us that for all of the characters at different points in the play. So that's what's really special to me. And her, I, w I want to see you say, bravery as a non-disabled playwright to actually write that in and to own that and to really stand by that in the 
in the uh, story she's telling. Um, yeah, it's really special. So I really stand by her being a non-disabled writer um, in the way that she's um, intertwined all those characteristics. Can I just add something? It's really divine to be playing a role which is not inspirational <laughs> or worthy or you know, any of those words that are applied to disabled people, it's just magnificent to be playing a role which is full of humanity and flaws and all the stuff that every other role is, you know, has in it. I just want to say that. Inspiration porn is what I call it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and these we characters don't need are it not. anymore. <laughs> They're so robust. All four characters are, are incredibly robust, and you're right, they're so thrilling. You know, there's so much going on with all of those characters. Great question. Thanks, Joel. Is there any others out there? Yes, over here. Anyone who wants to can take that one, as long as you've got a microphone. The question was, uh, and, and a bit of a comment, that usually at this stage, uh, a cast and a company that look like they're having fun usually turns out to be a good show, and the observation was that this is a bit of a serious one, and is everyone actually having a good time? <laughs> well, I, I'll jump in Who's there. got a microphone? I'm going to jump in there. Yeah, look, we're having a marvellous time, mainly because they've opened a sushi place just up the road. <laughs> They make a mozza out of everyone at Queensland Theatre. They should be one of our sponsors. I, I'd just like to say, well, it's, it's not a sort of play that I've ever done before. And for all of us, it's not a play we've ever done before. This, what, just the very subject matter makes it difficult. That in itself um, makes it something new and a struggle. And as Michael said, you know, and, it's, and we want to do its service, but it's for a tiny little play. You're very exposed here. And it's delicate and gentle and at the same time it's powerful and, and that sort of nuance, you know. And just the subject matter is new to me, um, as Kate said and, and Dan said, you know, the, the pleasure of them having to, because a lot of disabled actors haven't been given those parts that allow them to have complex depth, you know, they've been token characters. Mm -hmm. So that has its own challenges, I think. Uh, it's not that we're not having a good time, it's just hard work. <laughs> but, but that in itself is, makes it wonderful. I, th I think, to be honest, there has been an awful amount of love and care collectively to this work. I think it feels really important to us to share this piece. And in that way, we have put in a lot of work, really deep dedication to the piece feels very important for us to bring this to the stage. So it certainly hasn't been all laughs, but it's certainly been very rewarding every day, every day. Yeah, I think the, uh, the political dramas are, you know, not always a laugh a minute. However, I can, I can attest to some really beautiful work happening in that rehearsal room and some incredible rigour to the process and really understanding and representing characters incredibly well. Uh, and I swear there is laughter in the hallway, but also this is a, a team that's working six days a week at the moment to get a show up, so... <laughs> I think there's probably and some tired faces up here. I think one of the great things about this script is that um, it teaches a, an audience that it is okay to laugh. Like, we have had absolute belly laughs in the room and the black comedy that Martina laces through this is, is exceptional. And she goes from a huge laugh to, you know, something quite profoundly different on the turn of a dime. So the technical skill um, and the, I suppose, challenges of craft that this work demands of everyone is beyond uh, certainly anything I've ever done. 
And what that calls on is the richest of collaboration and the deepest of hearts to make sure that the work is taken care of and that each other are as well. And so I hope that is what you'll feel when you see this work. I hope you do get those big laughs, but I hope there's also something else that you can feel coming from this team because um, it's been a very, very special room. Indeed. Any other questions out there? Mm -hmm. Can someone please pass Sophia the microphone? Thank, Thank you. you so much. <coughs> Hello. Obviously, I identify as deaf, neurodiverse person, obviously. Um, I was originally an artist, um, and I'd like to, and then I added the label of disability to that later on in life. So, more recently in my life, that's been the case. I can feel the love and the care intensely from here. I feel like I'm home already. So it's just beautiful. I don't feel pornographically inspired at all. <laughs> Thank you, interpreter, that you caught that and you could read that. <laughs> There's some skilled people out there. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. I'm very excited. And I just wanted to say that I think fun looks different on different people. I can see that depth. Thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing the show, that's all. It's not really a question, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent statement. Any other burning questions out there? I think we've got a, a quiet, contemplative audience tonight. Oh, over here, sorry, beg your pardon. Um, the title is about acoustic living. It's uh, obviously double meaning. Is it going to be turned into a film? Because it's about 50% less fair or whatever. The question is the title, Cost of Living, uh, is it potentially going to turn people off because it's, people think it's referring to? Literally, the cost of living at the moment and 50 cent bus fares, etc. Priscilla, is that one you want to take? It's funny, isn't it? Because when I first read it, it wasn't so much part of the common language. And now, like in the last year or two, it's like bam, 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 you know, every news report, every paper you read. It's taken on a whole other meaning, uh, whereas for me it was always sitting in something more metaphorical. Uh, I, what can I say? It's part of what we're thinking and talking about, I think, because it is about class and it is about money. Um, and of course, it's about things much deeper than that as well. Um, I hope people get their 50 cent bus and come and see the show. <laughs> Talk about it with each other. Agree, agree. And I do think, you know, I think it's not a bad thing if people kind of go, geez, yeah, cost of living. I am going to go and see that. You know, I, I kind of hope that actually does translate in a different way with that current you know, saying that's so rife in our culture because I don't think they would be disappointed in this work. You know, I think they will see that there is a cost of living, uh, cost to living in lots of ways. So I'm not dissuaded and I hope it, I hope it, you know, does bring some people in who might have thought it's about, you know, trying to pay for their kids' excursions. It's hard to say. One more question. It sounds like a David Williamson play. Hmm, surprise. Also, if people want to see David Williamson and come in and see this, not going to be disappointed either. <laughs> Everything's coming up roses right now. Any other last questions before we move to the all-important raffle? Any closing statements from uh, the team on stage? Closing statements? I mean, other than come and see the show, we're previewing on the 15th of June and the season opens from the 20th of June and runs to the 13th of July. I imagine most of you have probably already got your tickets and then they'll be heading down to Sydney Theatre Company, our co-producers, uh, from the 19th of July for a month. So big thank you to this beautiful company of Cost of Living. <laughs> Come on down, Hannah. It is time to draw our prize winner for two tickets to see 14 by our friends at Shake and Stir Theatre Company at QPAC. Um, let's get, who wants to, Dan, do you feel like uh, drawing in the prize winner? Yep, Hannah, head over to Dan.
look then? <laughs> He's taken it for himself. Sorry. <laughs> it's mine now. Um, red E70. Red E70. <gasps> We've got a winner. Fantastic. <laughs> on your way out this evening, if you head on down to the box office and look for Hannah, Hannah will have that uh, prize for you to take home with you this evening. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the production.